Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. It's that time of the year again. After a year of working from home for most of us and finally being able to take a few days off, we can now relax and, uh, and enjoy the winter break. Some of us will go to a cabin maybe, uh, somewhere nice, as I will do very shortly and some others um, will stay wherever they are some others will maybe travel to a, an exotic um, summer location or a beach somewhere where they can just uh, relax on the beach and uh, and uh, enjoy the uh, the sun whatever you're gonna do it's time to sit back and uh, and enjoy uh, family and enjoy friends and uh, and just uh, relax it is also, the winter break is also traditionally a time when mainframers uh, pull out their terminals, uh, of course mostly virtual terminals on their computers, and many of us uh, indulge in a little mainframe project uh, during the winter break. It has also become somewhat of a tradition here on the Moshix mainframe channel to do command line and ASCII tricks at the end of the year. I remember a couple of years ago we looked at how to convert a video of a fireplace such as the ones you see here in this video and make it become an ASCII animation of a fireplace and uh, and we've done many other things with ASCII and command line uh, over the last four or five years here on the Moshix mainframe channel. So I thought today we'll do something that combines gaming and combines the retro things we used to do 30 years ago, 40 years ago, maybe some of us, uh, on, on a computer and combine it with the modern times of today and see if we can have a little bit of fun, relaxing fun, good wholesome fun uh, during this winter break with uh, terminal and ASCII and command line uh, tools. So let's get started. So I thought this winter break we all play a little bit of Infocom uh, adventure games. Infocom is well known as being at the time in the 70s and 80s the most successful and uh, the most creative and influential text adventure game uh, producer. Uh, I believe it also went public at some point, it became a public company. It doesn't exist anymore, it was acquired several times over. But uh, I think that many of the viewers of the Moshix mainframe channel will remember at least Zork, uh, Zork 1, Zork 2, Zork 3, or some of the other adventure games that they produced, highly influential, and, uh, and also very interesting on a technical level how they made uh, these games. So today we'll play, or this winter break, we'll play some Infocom adventure games. I've made here for us available an instance of a server in the cloud that you can access with your telnet and then play. So uh, let's just log in. We log in to our server here. The user is guest, the password is Zork. And upon logging in, we're presented with a menu of games we can play. And of course we have Infocom Zork 1, Zork 2, Zork 3, Deadline, um, we have Colossal Cave, which is uh, well known, even though it's not strictly a uh, an Infocom game, and then many others. I, I personally liked Sea Stalker a lot. I played that quite a bit. Planet Fall, and and others. So I think we have about uh, I want to say maybe 23, 24 adventure games. Most of them, I think about 21, 22 are Infocom games, including the. Uh, classic Infocom Zork games and you can log in here and uh, we can choose maybe Sea Stalker and um, once you select that with the space bar you can then press enter for OK and you will be put instantly inside the game and play as long as you wish and when you're done uh, you just uh, You exit oh. and you're back here again. And when you're done, 
uh, choosing the games that you want to play you just hit cancel here enter and you land back again on your terminal so telnet infocom dot bitnet dot systems that's all you need to do guest resort and play so of course we could spend here now an hour playing together but I think it, it's, it could be interesting to look a little bit first of all how infocom games were implemented and and then also show you a little bit how I implement these uh, this Moshix Telnet Adventure server that you see here how I implemented that and how I make sure you know how I secure it as much as humanly possible of course uh, you know you never know uh, what kind of creative ideas hackers or bad guys uh, come up with but um, but uh, look a little bit and how I make this all work so let's see what Wikipedia tells us about Infocom. It was an American software company based in uh, near Boston in Massachusetts and it produced, uh, as we all know, and uh, as I just mentioned, uh, adventure, text adventure games. It started in the late 70s and, um, and then it was acquired several times over. These are not all the acquisitions, but uh, Activision uh, then ultimately bought uh, the um, Infocom, I think, around mid 80s, but there were some more acquisitions involved. It wasn't as straightforward, and then uh, it was shut down in 89 when people started to play uh, video games and not so much uh, text games anymore, and uh, and then still still released some titles under the Infocom Zork brand, and then it abandoned the trademark in 2002. So still a very powerful trademark still a very powerful logo for people who were had home computers in the 70s uh, or even uh, sometimes people played these games also on deck uh, machines on vax machines because you could have some of this also um, play on other uh, non microcomputer architectures and we'll look into a little bit into how uh, this games became so portable because I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of the Infocom uh, games so um, the beginning it started with Colossal Cave so I, I, I misspoke before it is actually uh, um, not an Infocom game but it inspired Infocom games and so Colossal Cave which is also on uh, which we also have on our on, uh, on the Moshe Extended Adventure server as well here as you can see Colossal Cave and um, and so um, they wrote first Zork and uh, at the MIT, uh, on an MIT computer, I believe it was uh, a DEC machine, uh, maybe a DEC 10 or something like that. And then they uh, ported that game to the TRS-80 1980. Uh, still um, a very important game. Uh, uh, Tandy made it and uh, uh, there's always Septendi in September. There's always it's always Tendi month, and if you follow some of the other YouTubers out there, you'll see that in September there's always Tendi videos out there. I haven't though lately seen anybody play Zork on the Tendi because the two kind of go together. Um, and so Infocom were very very popular. I think everybody has played uh, uh, one or the other Info game at some point in their life, um, and the the info games game were noted for having more depth than any other adventure games and that's true uh, if you had all you had back then was a uh, a uh, monochrome terminal and a clunky keyboard and you were playing an infocom game such as zork or some of the others we we have here on the moshix adventure uh, server you were actually drawn in you were kind of in those games and it, it was it was better than than watching a movie today. It would really drew in, and you were on those games, and it's strangely addictive. Uh, you kind of have to try to see what I mean, but um, they had so much depth, and the storytelling was amazing, and it really made you feel like you're in the game, you're living inside the game. Uh, I don't know how to uh, describe it differently, but uh, that's how it was, and uh, and so. Um, that's how these video games, uh, that's why they were so popular. And then um, at some point in Activision, they had, uh, you know, when when the color 
uh, video games started and you know the ones where you like Frogger and all those games where you were moving stuff on the on the screen uh, that kind of uh, became the uh, the beginning of the end of text adventure games and um, of course um, video adventure games came back uh, later on I remember uh, Myst if you ever played that it's kind of like a an infocom game but it's 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 vi it's it's visual right you you use the mouse and you click on things so kind of you know the the idea is still there but of course it became uh, 3d over time and became color and video and all that stuff so um and here's just some of the games that they produced i, I don't have all the games these are uh, the ones that you see here, all the ones that I could find. I know there's maybe another five to ten more. Um, not that many more, but I think we have all the important ones. And um, and so let's see a little bit how the Infocon games became so portable. Um, what they did is um, Infocom very early on realized they needed to make the games playable on all the myriads of microcomputers out there because you had VIX, uh, 20 and 64s, Tandy, Ataris, uh, many different uh, Amigas of course and so what they did is they created a virtual machine called the Z machine um, which is a very simple architecture um, which is able then to, to run the Infocom games which were written for this uh, virtual machine called the Z machine and so all they needed to do is rewrite the Z machine for every new architecture uh, not terribly complex and then uh, and then they just they would just automatically run the Infocom games because they were all written for the Z machine and not for I know the Tandy architecture or the uh, 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 Commodore VIC 20 or VIC 64 architecture they just wrote the uh, virtual machine architecture and compiled it again for each new um, uh, underlying computer architecture and so um, and uh, and so to this day people still write and maintain uh, interpreters for the Z code or for the Z um, machine uh, to this day including for Linux so on Linux we have frauds um, I don't know who made Frots, but um, it's the one I use. And Frots itself runs on also on many different architectures. You can even run it on your iPhone. And it runs on Windows, DOS, uh, Mac OS, Linux, obviously. And uh, there's other interpreters for the Z code, but the one I use is this Frots here. Let's see if we can find a place uh, Frots. Z machine infocom. Let's see what it comes up with. Yep. So mm, it's just a SourceForge um, portable Z machine interpreter. Not much there, but it works. It's reliable. Uh, it's been around for a number of years. Uh, it was written in to 95 and 97, and it still runs fine. So um, it's, I think. Uh, uh, the one that I like to use the most and so let's now see how I implemented the Telnet adventure server using Frots and Linux and a few other important tools so tools such as uh, Docker's, Docker and, uh, and others. Okay so we are now on the server itself where uh, this Moshix Telnet Adventure Server is being served out from. And as you can see, I have here a little tool, you know, simple little tool that I wrote, which shows us all the connected uh, users so that I can monitor what's going on and uh, look for mischief and, uh, and trouble. Um, obviously, every time you open up a Telnet port, uh, immediately the bad guys uh, will start to access it. And so it's not uh, for the faint of heart to run a public Telnet server but it is uh, it is fun and also I've uh, as I mentioned I put in some tricks here and there to uh, trap the bad guys and I'm not going to go into uh, those uh, tools uh, and tricks more than I need to here publicly but uh, there is some stuff going on there on the background anyway so as you can see here um, 
there is a user connected and this user is running Bing Games and um, and connected 14 minutes ago because that's how long I've been making this video and it's running Moshix Infocom DOS so what's going on here let's stop this and and look a little bit first of all the every user uh, connecting is is, is being given uh, her own uh, container with the game um, inside so what what happens is that when people log in a new uh, 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 stateless container is being launched meaning that whatever happens inside the container is being thrown away when the container is destroyed so nothing is ever persisted that's the first principle here the second principle is that um, obviously we try to um, make people stick inside the container and inside the game and that whenever they manage one way or another to get out of the either this little uh, this little uh, uh, s s command tool menu that I wrote here um, they fall immediately out of the telnet connection so there is no um, there's no there should be um, you know if people end one way or another the game that they're playing they fall out of the telnet connection and so uh, those are the two main principles and of course um, this uh, this machine itself uh, has extensive uh, um, firewalling and uh, DDoS protection and uh, looking for people who connect several times and uh, and then bans them, uh, banning of IP addresses. So there's a lot behind the scenes. I'm not going to go into all of those things. Some are more obvious than the others, but that's what's going on. So for every user that logs in, uh, the user will get her own, uh, his or her own, um, or their own uh, uh, container running the Infocom DOS game inside. Of course, we have then frauds um, somewhere here. Um, where is frauds? Uh, I think yeah in user games I have fraud so if we start um, oops. yeah so also some other Modifications you can be root to run frauds. It needs to be run as a as a non-privileged user, and then frauds needs to be launched with a game, right? So, um, if I was now a non uh, a non-root user, then I could I could just say frauds and then I don't know Zork, and then this starts uh, the Zork game then inside the Telnet connection, and. Um, but before users even get to the to playing Zork, as you can see here, they have to go through a menu. And um, some people recognize this uh, from the Red Hat uh, installation procedure. That's exactly the same tooling here that I use. Uh, of course, I used to work at Red Hat. And, um, and so uh, the menu is being launched, which shows the possibilities. Then the user with the space bar uh, selects one or the other uh, you can only select one obviously and then when you then press enter it goes and launches then the user frauds with the game that the user has selected and if the user wants to get out then obviously it ends the connection right away um, so that's kind of the uh, high level architecture of this and um, and uh, so we'll, some other things I've done is to have um, read-only disks um, for the user and some, as I mentioned, there's, there's maybe a list of 15 to 20 uh, security features that I've added. I don't want this to be about security because it's about uh, the winter break and uh, about playing and relaxing. But um, this uh, is the way to that I implemented the server. And um, so the, when I log in, um then uh, um, then the, this thing starts and um, and it shows me um, what's going on, who's logged in, how long, and if anybody's doing any mischief. This is not the only 
monitoring panel I have. I have some others. Um, but um, I also have a counter here to see how many users since uh, the IPL of the virtual machine have, uh, have logged in. Uh, there is also one more thing I will say, which is that this is not running on Intel x86 uh, architecture. I'll stop right there. And the other thing I'm going to say is that um, that there is no Java involved, so log4j is not involved here at all. Uh, but as I said, this is not about security. This is about um, playing uh, these amazing games. And um, I, I personally, as I mentioned, I like Sea Stalker a lot and Planetfall. Um, there is one that is uh, not for children. And this video is for only for viewers 18 and above anyway. But uh, Invercom Leather Goddess, I think, is rated R. And so just uh, I mention it here. Um, and um, and then all the others are, are I think from age uh, 12 and up or something like that so um, this is it uh, and uh, for you so for those of you who don't remember how to log in it's also going to be in the description below this video but you just tell it to infocom.bitnet.systems and uh, the user is guest and the password is zork and once you uh, push, uh, type that in, you will be presented with this menu. And it's really all self-explanatory. So that is how this is all implemented. So I'll make the uh, server available for the next uh, month or so, so people can log in and play. I also often make it available again during the summer break. So it's winter break and summer break for me has always been traditionally a command line, uh, ASCII, uh, tricks and uh, and uh, playing around so uh, I thought I'll make this available for all of the viewers of the Moshe Explain Frame channel as well. Also as we are now getting to the end of the 2021 maybe a time to thank uh, all of the viewers of the Moshe Explain Frame channel. Uh, thank you all for being so active in the channel not only on youtube but also on the discord channel that we have and i'll link to it in the bottom in the description below this video also uh, the hundreds uh, or maybe thousands of viewers on the facebook page for the moshex mainframe channel which i'll also link to in the description below this video and uh, also for the thousands of comments emails and uh, little projects that i've done um, this year and in the years before with many of the members of the mainframe enthusiast community. Uh, just uh, the previous video to this one together with uh, Matthew Wilson we released this uh, virtual 1403 printer where people can get a beautiful 1403 font PDFs of their mainframe listings emailed to them uh, gorgeous, uh, gorgeous PDFs with with all the minutiae and all the little details, uh, correctly drawn and and. Uh, but also, I want to thank many of the dozens of people who have contacted me this year with uh, some goodies, mainframe goodies. I remember one person sent me the Edgar um, video editor for VMSP, the first uh, the first full panel. Uh, 3270 editor uh, on VM um, before xEdit I received some compilers uh, from ancient compilers on tapes and uh, and, uh, and many many other tools it's been really a year of uh, uh, of, of very interesting year for collecting old software and that's I think in part because people had more times on their hands over the last two years because of the COVID situation so maybe they went into the garage or many people also moved um, because of COVID and maybe they found a tape here and there and uh, and then that tape somehow got uh, uh, transferred to electronic uh, format and then I received I want to say maybe a total of 40 45 tapes this year and last year of ancient software as i mentioned some very old compilers some very old uh, pieces of uh, mainframe software that may be long forgotten but not by me and uh, and it's been very interesting to uh, 
um, restore that software and play with it a little bit just for you know for restoration purposes and for conservation purposes and uh, also this year we looked into the um, and some, some other architectures like the control data operating system NOS and uh, we had some in fun interviews on the channel also as you may know I'm operating my own real iron mainframe and made uh, learned a ton there about storage and what it means to actually run a real iron mainframe and connect it and make it available um, to enthusiasts around the world and running Linux on the mainframe so uh, uh, of course our HNET uh, NGE network has grown this year and I've made some new friends and uh, also met some friends um, traveling this year I met uh, Peter Jensen the person who wrote uh, channel to channel adapter a code for Hercules um, and met some other very interesting folks so it's been it's been an amazing year uh, for for the mainframe community and what I can see is that we're growing from strength to strength year to year uh, I believe that we have added some really amazing new possibilities uh, I want to just mention Brex the Rex interpreter for MVS 3.8 with extensive TCP IP capabilities who would have thought 40 years ago when MVS 3.8 came out that one day you could do TCP IP in Rex <laughs> from uh, inside MVS 3.8 in 24-bit something that didn't even exist back then uh, was is now possible to do and so the enthusiasm the creativity and the ingenuity of the enthusiast community around um, around MVS and VM 370 is just amazing and uh, really good people and if you are on them on the discord channel on the discord chat group now I'll also put a link below this video in the description there's hundreds of people there having very lively discussions sometimes maybe a little bit too lively but that's the nature of the game and so uh, this is just a way to thank you all for being so active for being so creative for being so amazing and thank you for being amazing and uh, see you again in the new year happy holidays mm -hmm.